chapter 13. What are genes and what kind of information can we uh, get from a genetic analysis? Um, in this chapter I want to explain generally what genes are, what influence they have on our body in terms of health, in terms of lifestyle, body weight and uh, athletic performance and so on. And uh, I want to differentiate between different kinds of genetic tests because they are not all the same. There are different kinds of tests that have different aims and uh, different roles. And it's important that you have an overview of what kind of genetic tests there are and what kind of tests that we perform. So let's first start with the question, what are genes? The human body uh, consists of around 50 billion cells. And every cell, with some exceptions, uh, red blood cells for example, but most of the other cells have a cell nucleus and the cell nucleus contains chromosomes. And these are these X shapes that you see here. And if you take a closer look at a chromosome, you see that it is a very tightly wound thread. And this thread is the DNA double helix. And that is where we have the genetic code. Um, in other words, the, the blueprint of the body, so really the information how the body needs to be built. And um, geneticists like to represent these genetic bases, which are basically just chemical structures, in letters. We call them A, T, G, and C. They are just short for certain uh, chemical words. Um, and uh, if you just stick with A, T, G, and C, then um, this is the, the sort of genetic codes that we work with. So here you see one strand. And now, now we come to the genes. A gene is a certain region in here that has a certain function. For example, there is a gene, a pigment gene, which means this, this genetic code region has the information of how to create a pigment, a color, that is then expressed in blue eyes, for example. And uh, so uh, a gene is really an instruction in a genetic code which tells the body how to do one or only a few processes. Now the problem is that many people or most of us have errors in these genes, genetic variations or, or real errors that completely destroy the function of the gene. And these are called mutations uh, if they're rarer or they're called genetic variations if they're more common. And here is an example. Uh, I have three genes. One of them is a coagulation gene. It's factor five. And this, uh, this gene inhibits blood clot formation in the bloodstream. Because you do want the wound to close up through blood clotting if you cut yourself, but you don't want this happening in the blood vessels. Then um, there is an enzyme gene. An enzyme is a small a small machine like uh, scissors that, that break up things or put things together. And in this case, this enzyme gene is called lactase, which is necessary to break down or digest the milk sugar lactose. And then there's a bone formation gene. It basically it's, it, it builds one of the components for, uh, for, for strong bones, called 1A1, and this builds strong bones. And now let's introduce a mutation into each of those. So here you see the letter change. In the coagulation gene, if this, this happens, this genetic variation, the instruction is disrupted. The gene no longer inhibits blood clot formation and it can lead to thrombosis. So a blood clot forms and, and blocks up the, um, the blood supply to one part of the body. If the enzyme gene is defective, then uh, the body doesn't know how to digest lactose and it, it forms lactose intolerance, one of the most common forms of food intolerances. And for bone formation, instead of building strong bones, uh, you build bones that, that uh, lose their density faster with age and it leads to osteoporosis. So really a small letter change in our three billion letters of genetic code can cause a severe disease. And it's just one letter. You have to consider every person, every human being has 3.2 billion letters. So A, G, C, T, G. If I continue reading in this, in this speed, uh, I would take 100 years just to read out the genetic code uh, contained within one cell. So it takes, uh, it takes ages because there's so much information. And just one specific letter change can cause such, uh, such a disease. Now, these are quite, uh, quite uh, severe examples, thrombosis, lactose intolerance, osteoporosis. 
Um, it is estimated that every one of us has around 2,000 genetic defects, or um, more correctly said, uh, genetic variations, that influence our, our body in a negative way. They're not all as, as severe as causing life-threatening diseases, but they can make our eyes a little, a little um, um, weaker, uh, our eyesight, or they can reduce the effectiveness of our immune system, or make our legs shorter or longer, um, and so on. So, so really there are a multitude of negative genetic variations that can influence our body, and every one of us has a different combination, which is really why every one of us, us has other um, um, genetic talents as well as risks uh, for diseases. So the question is, these mutations or these genetic variations, how do we get these mutations? And there are a number of ways. For one, radioactivity. Radioactive radiation can hit a DNA strand and it can break the code and then you actually get a letter change there. Then UV radiation. So UV radiation from the sun, for example, uh, hits our skin and then it can hit a, uh, a gene or a genetic code and make a change, which is why we can get skin cancer from, from too much sun exposure. Uh, soot or smoke. So there are certain chemicals which, when they reach our body, can grab onto DNA and break it. And then there are copying errors. You have to consider if an embryo is created, you have an egg and a sperm, and they together, each one of them contains half of the genetic code that, uh, that a cell will have. So they fuse together and then you have one full set of 3.2 billion letters. And for the, the organism to grow you need more cells. So you need to copy the whole thing once to create two cells. So copy 3.2 billion letters and then you get two. Copy them again you get four. Copy them again you get eight. So really to, to create 50 billion cells you need to copy DNA a lot. And um, this is surprisingly error-free, but nevertheless, from one generation to the next, you end up with around three uh, changes per generation. So, uh, if you look at my parents and at me, I will have a mixture of the genes from my parents, but there will be, on average, three changes that will be different in me compared to my parents. So, copying errors are uh, also one of the, the sources. Um, there's w one more thing I want to say here. While radioactivity is absolutely a mutagen, a cause of genetic mutations, it is usually not as severe as the copying errors because uh, radioactive rays or UV radiation hits my cell in, in my skin and it by chance hits the lactase gene. So my skin cell loses the information of how to digest lactose doesn't really matter to my skin cell because my intestine needs to know how to, how to digest lactose. So really these, these kinds of mutations that happen, they happen in individual cells and they don't usually have any impact on, on a person's health. The only exception is cancer. So we have anti-cancer genes and when these are disrupted in one cell, then this cell starts to grow uncontrollably. So one cell becomes two, four and it grows into a tumor. But that's a, a rare occurrence. So, so really the, the genetic variations that, that do influence our health severely are the ones that are inherited from our parents because they are in the first cell and this cell becomes two, four, eight and every cell of my body is going to have this, uh, this genetic variation. So really our health is mostly influenced by genetic variations that have originated some time ago in our human history, 40,000 years ago, uh, 1 million years ago, and these variations now um, make our health, uh, um, influence our health negatively. Okay, um, now let's look at a few different genes and let's have a look at what mutations can do to our body. So as I said, there's a co coagulation gene, factor V, which prevents blood clot formation. The lactase gene um, splits up lactose in our, uh, in our um, intestine. There's a renal tissue gene called, for, called COL4A5, which builds strong kidney tissue so, th so that the kidneys can work and remove toxins from the body. 
then there's a, a fat intake gene which regulates how much fat we absorb from food. So we eat something fatty and it absorbs it. It regulates how much of it. And there's an iron uptake gene which absorbs iron from our food. So really there's usually one gene which has one or a few, a few, few uh, functions and all of these together builds the, the blueprint of our body. Now if we look at the renal tissue gene that I used as an example, as I said, it builds strong kidney tissue. Now let's say um, through a copying error, um, it happened that a genetic code was changed. This happens by chance, it's, it's just a copying error, it's nothing deliberate, and it happens outside the gene. This will usually not have any influence. There are millions of these variations in every person's genome that don't have any impact on it because they are in a, let's say, genetic chunk in between the genes that are the important parts. The other parts are also, they have some importance, but most of these variations have no impact on a person's health. However, if one of these mutations happens within a gene, it can disrupt the function. And then we lose the information of how to build strong kidney tissue. And in the case of this gene called 4A5, uh, the person will have progressive renal failure. So the kidneys start to fail. Now, a doctor will see progressive renal fa failure and usually a young person and will ask why is this happening. And if he knows enough about genetics, he will know that it might be uh, the, the disease. Um, he will do a genetic test for the call 4A5 gene then you will usually read out the whole genetic code of this gene. It's a very big analysis. You need to do uh, tests for several uh, thousand genetic letters and then compare them to, to what we know to be healthy, uh, healthy code. And this kind of analysis is usually quite expensive in the region of 1,500 euros to test uh, one gene. And then in the end you will get a report and it will say, yes, we have found a mutation in this gene, this is indicative of the disease Alport syndrome. And then uh, you have the diagnosis and then you know the reason for this renal failure. And um, this disease, just for an example, is very rare. So only one in 50,000 people has it. So does it really make sense to test this gene in every person? Unlikely, because you're going to have one positive result in 50,000 or 49,999 negative results. So these kinds of genetic tests is what people usually consider to be genetic tests. It's a rare disease, you need a diagnosis, you don't know why this is happening, then you do a genetic test um, and then you confirm it through finding a mutation in this gene and then you know this mutation causes this disease and it's, it's a diagnostic effect. For, for example, this disease is not treatable, so it's really just finding out why this is happening. So this is the normal type of genetic test that people consider to be genetic tests, the rare diseases. There are around 6,000 different genetic diseases that are known. There are uh, genetic tests for around 3,000 of these. We do have them in our portfolio, but these are actually the, the less interesting ones because they're really just diagnosis. You find out what is wrong and usually you don't get any specific treatment or prevention from these kind of um, genetic tests. It's just diagnostic. Then there are uh, genetic variations for common diseases. And now I need to explain a term called polymorphisms. If you take the genetic code of one person and lay it out in one line, as I said, 3.2 billion letters, and that's where the genes sit. Around uh, 30,000 genes are interspersed on this genetic code. And if you then take another person, um, maybe unrelated, and you take this person's gene and, and genes or DNA and put it next to each other, you will find that it's almost identical. You will find the same gene at the same location. You will have the same genetic code in genes you will only find around a, a change on average one in 1,000 genetic letters. So it's almost the same. Um, you only get a few variations. And these are called polymorphisms. The difference between a polymorphism and a mutation is polymorphisms are common. They uh, appear in many people. Mutations are uncommon. They happen in one individual or in one family. So it's really the same thing. It's only, um, it's only a different term that we use. So if we look at these polymorphisms here, 
this is where the genetic code would be different between two different people. Many of them, or most of them, will be somewhere in the genetic uh, area which has no function or no important function, and uh, some of them will be in genes. And these variations, as I said, are quite common, and there's a, a difference uh, one in 1,000 bases, which is actually surprising because if you take the DNA from a chimpanzee and you put it next to each other, again, it's, it's very similar. The genes are usually in the same places, and you will have a difference of one in 100 bases. So um, it's really surprising. It, we have the same evolutionary history, and we can still see that in our genes. All right, so these genetic variations, as I said, most of them are somewhere where they don't matter, and sometimes they disrupt the gene and have a function. And this is something you, you will have to remember. They're called single nucleotide polymorphisms, so single letter uh, changes. And um, there is a, a term that scientists use. Uh, the short term is SNP, single nucleotide polymorphisms, and scientists like to use the word uh, SNPs. As, as explaining this. So uh, really when you hear about SNPs, it's a very common term, these are these genetic variations where one person has a letter A and a pers uh, at a position and someone else has a letter C. They're very common. There are around 10 million known polymorphisms in the human genome when they looked at people from different areas. Uh, they found 10 million different variations. Um, the majority have no impact on health, on the body, on, any, on anything. And as I said, around 2,000 of these polymorphisms influence our health negatively. Now let's look at a common example. Lactose intolerance or tolerance is a, is a, a very common uh, example of a food intolerance. And lactose, when we eat it, and you can see here, this is the inside of an intestine. When lactose is eaten with food, so when milk uh, or milk products are ingested, then uh, this cannot be absorbed into the intestine. You first need a lactase gene, so the gene has some information in it, how to build an enzyme. You can picture it as a small scissors. And this enzyme can then break up lactose into smaller sugars. Lactose is really a combination of two sugars that are bound together and the enzyme cuts them into two pieces, into glucose and galactose, smaller sugars. And these sugars have the advantage of being uh, absorbable. So the body can use the sugar as a source of energy. Very important in babies, because this is one of the energy sources that they get from the mother's milk. Nature is quite conservative with energy. And uh, in the Stone Age, or usually mammals, uh, they need to be able to digest milk when they're babies because they get milk from the mother. It's, it's crucial for survival. However, when they're grown up, a grown up cow doesn't ever drink milk again. A grown up uh, Neanderthal or, or our ancestors, they don't uh, drink milk anymore because they, they used to not have cows or any sources of milk. So nature decided, let's save the energy of building this enzyme if we don't need it. So there's a genetic element, this here, which begins with increasing age to turn off the gene because it's no longer needed. So the enzyme is not produced and it usually doesn't matter because the cow or the deer doesn't drink milk anymore when it's grown up. Now humans started to, to cultivate uh, cows and now we can drink milk when we're adults and then the lactose uh, is is digested by bacteria because it's not taken up bacteria produce all sorts of acids and, and waste products that then cause uh, severe digestive, uh, digestive problems and this is what you see the amount of lactase enzyme over uh, over the age is usually very high at the beginning and then it starts to decline which means that one in six people um, in one in six people, the lactase enzyme is gradually switched off and it will first cause mild symptoms if you eat milk products and it will become uh, increasingly severe. Now, there is a genetic variation that disables this switching off function. And um, this is a SNP, a very common polymorphism that has developed and that is, is common in people of European ancestry. 
and in this case the enzyme is produced even with increasing age and the sugars can then be taken up so even grown-ups can can drink milk if they have this genetic variation so it's not a, not a variation that causes the disease but actually something that was beneficial and this is what happens in these people five out of six, six people with European ancestry uh, produce the lactate, lactase enzyme constantly and they never produce uh, symptoms of lactose intolerance. So the question is if this is the variation that the mutation, the abnormal thing, why is it so common in, in uh, European ancestry? And that's actually quite an interesting uh, story. Uh, between 40 to 10,000 years ago um, humans have already populated Europe and in the north of Europe, uh, people think, uh, or scientists estimate that it was around in Sweden, this genetic variation occurred in one person. And this was the first person as a grown-up that could drink milk without getting digestive problems compared to all of the others around him. And during that time, uh, there was famine. So not much food available, many people died. And this person had an advantage because they already had uh, had animals that they could get milk from, but most of them couldn't drink any, he could. So he had such a big survival advantage in these times that uh, he had children that also had this genetic variation. These children again had this genetic variation. This person is a direct ancestor to 80% of people of, uh, with European ancestry. So really this genetic variation happened in one person, it was inherited to lots of other people and it was such a big advantage that it really populated, repopulated Europe. So that, that is one very common uh, polymorphism as I said, 80% uh, have it and 20% don't have it and those 20% of the European population become lactose intolerant. There's some more information about lactose intolerance in case you're interested in, a, in another training, but I'm just giving a few short examples. Another one is the iron overload disorder. There's a gene which says I need iron from food. It absorbs iron, but it says don't, don't absorb too much because too much iron can be, uh, can be detrimental to health. And a genetic variation in this gene can disrupt this process, so too much iron is absorbed. So this is what happens. Iron in the blood is increasing over the, uh, over the years. At the beginning there are no symptoms, but then you start to be, uh, develop joint pains, um, you get susceptibility to infection, so immune system gets weaker, uh, you become a diabetic, eventually your liver is damaged and it's, it's fatal if you don't get treatment. Now a doctor will usually find, this is what happens now, will usually find at some point uh, that these symptoms are indicative of hemochromatosis. That's the technical name of iron overload disorder. And then he will do a genetic test. And this will confirm, yes, there's a genetic variation. However, this is unfortunately still a rare occurrence because 76% of diagnoses are wrong. So they say diabetes, we know that, let's treat it. But the cause of it is really uh, iron toxification. And it's not, um, it's not diagnosed correctly. However, this doctor has done a genetic test, he knows, and then he starts with bloodletting therapy. Blood contains a lot of iron, a form of hemoglobin, the red stuff in the, in the blood that transports oxygen. So when you remove our, uh, blood from the body, the body builds up new blood and uses up some iron. So really you can reduce the iron content by a regular bloodletting, and then if you continue this for the rest of your life, you can keep it in a normal range. The problem is that the diseases that have already developed will remain and usually the life expectancy is severely reduced. So this is a typical genetic, uh, genetic test that is done to diagnose the disease. However, there is a way to use this information in a preventive manner because this genetic variation is present from birth, from actually from the time the embryo uh, has been created by fusion of the egg and the sperm. From that point on, we already know that this person has this genetic trait. Now, using this exact same genetic test that's being done in, um, in hospitals worldwide, but if you do it before you can even uh, detect elevated iron levels, you can find out this person has this genetic variation. And then you can start prevention. 
and this is very specific prevention because this person should go to blood donations. It's the same as the therapy. You remove blood from, from your body. Your body uses up more iron to, to build up more blood. And then you keep it in the normal range for, for the rest of your life. You help other people with your donations, but you also remain healthy. So really it's the same genetic test. One time you do it to find out what caused the problem, and the other time you're using it to prevent the problem to occur. That's preventive genetic medicine. And that's, uh, that's one of the big focuses that we have. So we have rare diseases um, that only affect one in 50,000. Uh, we have common diseases which affect most of us. Then we have medication, the way medication works on, uh, in our body, which is also influenced by, by genetics. For example, uh, drugs like aspirin or, or some, uh, some medication only have a desired effect in around 60% of the population. It's more for some drugs, less for others, but usually we know that they don't work the same in everyone. And some people have side effects, which can also be deadly. Some people have no effect. And um, the statistics tell us that one out of 12 hospital patients suffer from severe side effects. They're there for, for some problem, but they really get another problem through drugs that they are taking. And one out of 250 dies due to these side effects. So really they die not because of the disease or the problem that they have, but from the treatment. And it is the fifth most frequent cause of death, death in the Western world. So it's, it's really one of the big problems that we have. Without medication, of course, many more people would die, but many people also die because of drug side effects. And there are certain genes which, which control how these uh, drugs are converted in our body. And um, let me show you an example. If you take a drug, for example, you swallow a pill, the drug uh, enters into the body and shows its effect. Then the drug is recognized in the body as something that shouldn't be there because these, these drugs, these chemicals should not be there according to the body. So the liver has enzymes that recognize it, modify it and more or less tag it for removal from the body. And this enzyme comes from an enzyme gene. Um, the modified drug is then recognized by the kidneys and then is removed from the body. And so uh, what happens if you, if you take a drug? It, increases in blood level and then it goes down again. So this is, here is how, how it would look. So it goes up and then it slowly is removed again. And then you are, in, you are in the effective dose of the drug for some time, for example, you get less headache. And usually your headache only lasts a few hours, so you're covering this very well with an active dose. Now there are some other drugs which should be in active range for longer, like antibiotics, which you should take for a week. So what you do is you take it in regular intervals. Whenever you will go down again, you take it again. And then you always stay in the effective dose of the drug. Now, that's the normal way that it should work. However, some people have a genetic variation that disrupts the function of this enzyme gene. So the drug is taken, it still has its effect, but the gene is not producing the enzyme. So what happens? The drug is not broken down, not modified, it's not removed from the body, and it starts to accumulate if you take it several times a day. So really what happens is it, you get more and more of the drug, and you go beyond the effective dose and you get severe side effects. Uh, there's an example, warfarin is a blood thinner. Um, this is modified by one of these genes, and a genetic variation can lead to uncontrollable bleeding as side effect because the drug has just had such a high dose. So really drugs, how medication works is also influenced by genetics. So we can do a genetic test, we can find out this drug should be reduced in dose, this should not be used and this one is okay. Then um, moving into the more lifestyle kind of area, body weight, obesity is also controlled by, by genetics. And let me explain one example. This again is the inside of an intestine. And this person has had a fatty meal. And um, the body recognizes there is fat in the intestine. Great, let's, take, let's absorb it because it has a lot of energy. We can use it to, um, to create new cell walls and so on. So the body starts absorbing it. And it will then use it up or store it somewhere. 
And then there is, there is a stage where a fat absorption gene says, okay, thank you, we had enough. And it will stop the absorption. I have to say, this is very simplified. The, the concept or the process behind it is much more complicated, but uh, the example demonstrates the, the mechanism behind it quite well. So this gene says, okay, thank you, we had enough. And the rest of the fat stays in the intestine and then it's, it's excreted from the body. Then there are some people which have a variation in this gene, which means this gene does not work as it should be. And then fat is absorbed and the body gets all of it. And the problem is the more fat you eat, very fatty foods, you absorb even more. And some of it is used up and the rest is saved, is stored somewhere for, uh, for meager times in future. And that's the problem of obesity, too much fat stored. So a genetic variation can influence how sensitive you are to the amount of fat that you eat. There are, there are brilliant scientific studies that have shown if you give a person twice as much fat to eat, some people will gain weight, as you would expect, and some don't, because they just don't absorb it. So really, body weight is, uh, is modified by genetics. And when a person wants to lose weight, and the question is, should it go for a low-carb diet? Everybody has heard about those. Or low-fat diet, the opposite a balanced diet, a little bit of both, and there, there are lots of different options. And really from genetics we can find out if your body does not absorb fat as effectively, uh, the fat stays in the intestine and low fat is not going to do much. The same thing goes for carbohydrates. Some people um, get, um, gain more weight from carbohydrates, others do not. So really we can find out how your body is built, how much of each of these uh, substances is absorbed and we can find out from a genetic test what is most effective, low fat, low carb and so on. So this is body weight. Next question, uh, diet or nutrition. Everybody's heard about what is healthy uh, to eat. You should eat fruit, lots of vegetables, uh, low fat um, and so on. So everybody thinks that, um, thinks that there is one way of how to eat healthy. However, this is not really true. Let me explain the concept of nutrigenetics, so nutrition genetics. This is a growing field. Now, let's look at three people with a genetic disease. One is lactose intolerant. One is gluten intolerant, so he cannot digest uh, wheat, or actually he gets bad reactions from wheat, he can digest it. And the other person has the iron overload disorder, so absorbs too much iron. Now, these three people listen to the general guidelines of healthy diet. And these say dairy products are healthy, they are a good source of calcium. Now, the lactose intolerant person will not agree. When he eats milk products, he will get uh, severe side effects. He's going to feel very, very ill and very bad. And this guideline really does not apply to him. Gluten intolerant people that have problems with wheat protein will say, yeah, sure. It's a good source of calcium. It's, uh, it's healthy, it tastes, tastes good. So. That's true. And people with iron overload disorder also apply. Then wheat, uh, maybe whole meal bread, where you have lots of wheat protein, will not be a problem for a lactose intolerant person. For a gluten intolerant person, it's unhealthy. And for the iron overload disorder person, again, it has lots of fiber, it's good for digestion, it's really healthy. So again, this only applies to some people. And red meat, uh, low-fat red meat is a good source of iron so people people who have iron deficiency for example are advised to eat more red meat so it is true for lactose intolerant people good source of iron same for gluten intolerant people but people that are already absorb too much iron from diet should really not eat much red meat but uh, low iron content foods so really these these guidelines are as good as they can be when you have to issue one guideline for everybody but really every person is genetically different has different risks different different disease risks uh, different strengths and weaknesses and so really one guideline for everybody is not possible as you can see in this example and nutrigenetics does this uh, they look at what your genetic variations are and how to modify your nutrition to make sure you get the right nutrients, you avoid the wrong nutrients, and you maintain optimal health. So this is nutrigenetics. Uh, people say this is 
uh, some people say this is, uh, this is stuff of the future. Uh, 20 years ago, maybe they were right. Uh, in the future, we're going to be much better than we are now, but nutrigenetics is already present, uh, present because every person that has lactose intolerance, that's 20% of Europe, they already avoid lactose-containing uh, uh, food. So this is nutrigenetics in action. And then there's also talent for competitive sports. Sport really is filtering for the right genes for optimal performance. Athletic sports, uh, uh, competitive sports. Lots of people try to compete, and only the ones that have the optimal combination of genes um, um, wins. Um, it's, it's very easy to, to understand in a pro basketball player or someone who wants to become a pro basketball player who has short legs, genes make his legs, legs short, is not going to have much chance. And there are some other variations that influence the structure of our muscle cells. Am I more towards uh, power or endurance? And there's a gene, actually there are two genes, um, that influence this. So for example, you can have two endurance genes you can have one endurance and one power gene or two power genes. And we know from, from scientific studies that if you have either of these variations of the genes, that uh, they are better for power. Power is uh, strong forces, quick reactions like sprinting where you have to really, uh, really start quickly. However, they tire very quickly. And if you want to run a marathon run, that would be bad. Now what scientists did is they looked at, um, at these genes and looked at the control group, the general population that does not perform any sport, and they found that 14% have two endurance genes, which are good for marathon running, but they are bad for sprinting, for example. So 14% have bad genes for sprinting, of people that don't do sport. And then they looked at the pro sprinters, so people that are in the Olympic or World Championships in sprinting. And they found that only 3% of them had the wrong genes for sprinting. So really, uh, from the general population, lots of people decided, I want to become a pro sprinter. However, only a select group made it. And out of these, mostly the ones with the right genes made it. It doesn't mean that it's impossible, because still 3% of them have the wrong genes for their sport. But the chance, in this case, is five times worse to reach the Olympic level if you have the endurance genes. So really athletic performance and uh, musical ear, all of this is genetically uh, influenced. So really genetic testing can tell us anything from rare diseases, standard genetic tests, common diseases, medication, uh, talents, as well as body weight and healthy nutrition. So these are all of the different areas and they are classed in three different groups. One of them is lifestyle analyses. This is really not about diseases, it's about uh, optimizing body weight, it's about sports, it's, it's general information about your body that has not got to do anything with, uh, with a disease. Then there are medical analyses that are commonly used for preventive purposes, but also for diagnostic purposes. And then there are rare diseases which are usually, usually only diagnostic in nature. So um, we as our laboratory network have uh, tests in, in all three categories. However, the really interesting ones are the medical analyses where you have preventive, uh, preventive uh, potential, where you can help people stay healthy when they have a genetic risk. Uh, we can also optimize the treatment. Obviously, if you have a disease, you need effective treatment. And lifestyle analyses also help people to maintain their body weight and so on. So that's the end of chapter number 13, what are genes and what kind of information do we get from genetic analyses.